Hi, I'm Robin. Welcome to a video on the Dubot Fishing Kit. So, I received a review unit of the Dubot Fishing Kit from a local Dubot supplier. In this video, I will take a look at what the system can do, how to program it, and hopefully provide some insights on its use cases. This is not intended as a full review, but rather my first experiences with it. I quickly found that the software has so many features that it's impossible for me to go through all of them without making this video extremely long. So I picked a couple of examples from the user guide and also made some programs myself to get familiar with the software. Hopefully this will give you enough insight on if the system is suitable for your application. It is mainly targeted at the educational market, but might be interesting for other segments as well, like startups. Quick disclaimer, I was not paid for doing this review. Any of the opinions expressed here are my own and I'm sending the unit back after the review is done. Let's start with the hardware. The fishing kit has a camera mounted to a stand. This allows you to use the camera even without a robot arm. Also, the camera can capture an image while the robot arm is out of the frame when handling parts, making this the most efficient option in terms of cycle time. The camera stand is mounted on a solid aluminium plate with a cutout for the robot arm. There's one for the Dubot Magician and also one for the Dubot M1. The camera is a 5 megapixel model from Higgs Vision with a fixed focal length. It is a 1 over 1 8 inch sensor and a lens with a 12 mm focal length. This should be comparable to a 58 mm focal length for a full frame camera. It has the entire recessed area of the table in view when the camera is mounted to the top of the stand. The aperture and the focus of the camera can be set manually and locked into place to prevent any accidental changes. Assembly of the system can be done in under 10 minutes. It involves only screwing the stand into the bottom plate and assembling the camera fixture. The ring light is mounted onto the camera close to the front element. This does mean that you have to rotate the entire ring light when focusing the camera. This works fine as long as you lock the focus ring when you're done adjusting it. I found the ring light to provide sufficient lighting across the entire visible area. The Vision Kit comes with two software programs, MVS and the Dubot Vision Studio. With the MVS software, you can check the live view of the camera and save images and videos. However, you will be spending most of your time in the Dubot Vision Studio software. This is a fully featured machine vision programming environment. My first impression was that it is very user friendly. All programming can be done by creating flows. Simply put, this is dragging function blocks into the working area and indicate the order in which they need to be processed by linking them together with connectors. I will show some examples of how this works later on in the video. For more advanced users, there's also a script language available, but that is beyond the scope of this video. Although the software is user-friendly, for complete novices in the world of machine vision, it can feel a bit overwhelming, given the sheer amount of options available to you. The best way to get the hang of it is to go through the entire manual front to back before you start playing with the software. It is well written and loaded with pictures and examples, so it's quite a pleasant read. The last section covers a number of examples that you can use to get started with the vision system and explore the possibilities before creating your own projects. In this video, I will cover a number of these examples and two of my own projects. In the limited time I had available with the review unit, I was able to test only a limited amount of the available functionality. I feel that I have only scratched the surface of what is possible, but regardless, I hope that this still gives you a good impression of the vision kit. Let's quickly go through the interface. On the left, there is a taskbar where you will find all of the available functions. In the center, there's a working area where you can create your flows. On the right side, the camera image is displayed and below it, the results for each function can be monitored. A flow typically starts with an image captured by the connected camera. It makes sense to adjust the exposure and focus of the object that's being captured before you proceed making a new flow. The image can be zoomed in to verify if the object is in focus. The first example is a pick and place exercise with color identification, which is covered in detail in the manual. 
I'm going to make a flow that detects only the blue blocks. After detecting a blue block, the flow will guide the arm to the part, pick it up and drop it off at a specified location. I have a magician robot arm, which I'm using for this application, but you could also use a Dubot M1 robot arm, if you're lucky enough to own one. We start the flow with the camera block, which captures an image from the connected camera for processing. The next block is a color extraction block, which can apply a filter to the image to only highlight a specified color. All of the blocks can be double clicked to change the settings specific to that function. I'm not going over all of the settings in detail, I will just discuss the ones needed for this project and why I'm changing them. Make sure to set the camera to capture a color image, so we can actually detect colors. You can press the play button to capture an image, or the continuous cycle button to keep running the flow over and over again. This will allow you to change the settings and immediately see the results of your changes. In this case, I'm playing around with the settings, so only the blue colors remain visible. Now we need to make sure that the software can actually identify these white regions as the parts and determine their position. The next blocks, image morph and blob detection, will create a rectangular shape from the white areas in the frame and find the center position of these rectangular areas. The last part of the image processing is a calibration transformation. This will convert the coordinates the camera found into coordinates for the robot arm. This is done by loading a calibration file which holds all of the information needed for the software to convert a coordinate in the image to a real-world coordinate. You have to create this file when you set up the camera for the first time, and you can reuse it over and over again as long as you don't change the position of the camera. The calibration procedure is quite straightforward. You load the calibration program and place the calibration sheet on the table. The camera recognizes nine points in the pattern. The procedure then needs you to move the arm manually to each of these calibration points in the correct order, as accurately as possible, and enter the coordinates in the software. When this is done, you can create a calibration file. You can then use this file in any of your projects where you need to convert coordinates in the image to a real-world coordinate for pick-and-place operations, or for example to calculate if dimensions of a part are within specification. Okay, back to the example. Now that we've determined the real-world coordinates of our parts, specific Dubot Magician blocks can be used to pick up the parts and to operate the suction cup. The whole idea of connecting the blocks in the editor is that you can indicate the order of events. But this also allows blocks to reference the output from previous blocks. For example, in the Move block, you can reference the X and Y output as calculated by the Calibration Transformation block. For the z-value, which is the depth to which the arm moves, I'm not referencing anything. But instead, I'm moving the arm to a depth where the suction cup touches the part and I check the current z-value. This value can then be entered in the move block to make sure the arm goes to the correct depth, in this case minus 30. In order to complete the flow, we need a block to make the arm go to the part, a block to activate the vacuum cup, a block to take the part to a specified location, and lastly, a block to deactivate the vacuum cup and drop the part. Now let's see the cycle in action. In the next example, we will try to identify circles, measure their diameter, and based on some acceptance criteria, put them in a reject bin or a bin for good products. Here we can also start with the camera block, but this time with a monochromatic image. Next is a find circle block, which automatically detects the circles in the image based on the criteria you set, like minimum or maximum value, contrast, etc. The next block is a scale transformation that converts the radius of the part from pixels to a real-world distance. Again, this is based on the calibration file created earlier. Now we do a calibration transformation to do a similar conversion, but this time for the center coordinates of the circle. 
So now we know both how large the circle is and where it is located. The next blocks are for moving the part and to activate the suction cup. We then need to decide whether the part is pass or fail. You can use an if module to check the size of the radius found in the scale transformation and add some acceptance criteria. In this case, a radius between 10 and 20 millimeters. So anything falling within this range will make the if module put out a one and anything else will generate a zero as output. In this case, one means pass and zero means reject. When we link a branch block to this, we can then go to different subflows based on the results. One of the flows takes the part to a reject bin and the other takes the part to the location where the good parts need to be dropped. Okay, let's take a look at the program in action. Now for a more practical case, just imagine you are a manufacturer of coasters with the shape of a flower. Sorry, but this is the first thing I found when I was looking for examples, but please bear with me. I think this is quite an interesting example for computer vision. Imagine we are trying to measure the diameter of the coaster to see if we don't have any shrinkage problems or other issues that could cause a dimensional defect. For the sake of time, I've already created the flow here and we'll go through it at high level. Again, we start with the camera block to capture the image. This is followed by a fast match block. This is a function that can identify patterns in the entire image regardless of their position or orientation. This is a very powerful feature and easy to train. The idea is that you draw a rectangle around a feature that you would like to find in the image. If needed, you can play around with the settings to create a tighter fit or something that is more forgiving to deviations. This function will find all of the instances of the feature in the image. In this case, all of the leaves on the coaster. We can then apply a function to find the peak of the feature and create a coordinate out of it with the points assemble function. If we then drag a loop around this, we can tell the software that we would like to do this for every leaf on the coaster. The amount of times the loop is executed can simply be referenced back to the amount of features found by the previous fast match block. All generated points are then used as input for the next block, a circle fit function. This even detects outliers and gives them a red color. Lastly, we can do a scale transformation to convert the found radius from pixels to millimeters. This will give us the real world diameter of the coaster. To have some indication on how repeatable the measurement is, I picked up the part and placed it back at a random position on the table. This is not a scientific experiment, so please take these numbers with a grain of salt. You can see the results in the graph below. The standard deviation of the measurements is only 22 microns, which is quite good actually. It has to be noted that the repeatability of the system is dependent on many factors such as contrast, lighting, how the system was trained to find features, etc. etc. So your mileage may vary. So now for the last experiment. In order to mimic a real-world scenario, I've drawn up a small part with some features that we can measure. The part has no purpose at all and is not meant to resemble any particular shape, although my daughter thought I printed a bunch of horses. I actually think they look more like the cabin of a truck, but it's all in the eye of the beholder, I guess. I picked some specific features that I wanted to measure and set specific acceptance criteria for them. Here they are. I printed a couple of these parts to the nominal size and some parts that are intentionally out of specification to see if the vision kit can correctly reject these out of spec parts. Also, on one of the parts, I intentionally omitted one of the holes to see how I could deal with that in the Vision Studio software. This is a program I created for verifying all of the specifications. It might seem like a big plate full of spaghetti, 
but it's just a combination of many separate checks which all feed into the end result. At the top, it starts again with a camera block to capture the image, followed by a fast match block to recognize the part geometry. You have to show this block what the part looks like the first time you use it, similar to the feature recognition for the coaster example. Here it finds five instances of the part. Even without measuring, you can already see that two of the parts seem to fit the signature quite well. On three of the parts, there are some deviations visible, which are marked in red. The fitting quality could also be used to reject parts, but we are actually going to measure according to the specifications. I will go through the flow at a fairly high level. At the top of the flow, there are several blocks that try to find either lines or circles in specific locations of the part. The green rectangle around the feature indicates the search area. The output data from these blocks is then used to perform the measurements. Here, block 20 measures the angle between two of the found lines, in this case, block 6 and 18. Block 9 measures the distance between the found line in block 3 and the circle in block 4. Block 12 does exactly the same thing, but now for the bottom hole. Block 15 measures the distance between the lines from block 6 and 7, which represents the height of the part. Block 8 finds the bottom left circle and measures its diameter. For all of the measurements, the dimensions are scaled using the calibration file, similar to the previous examples. They all feed into the if module, which checks if all of the dimensions are within specification. Here are some examples of the measured parts. This part is passed on all criteria, so it is marked as OK. This next part fills the dimensional inspection. It is part 1b, which is modeled in CAD to be a reject by design. It misses the lower left hole, which is correctly picked up by the software. Since it cannot find the hole at all, values for this feature are registered as zero, which is outside the diameter specification for this hole. Also, this third part fails the specification. It is a printed part from design 1C, which has slight dimensional errors. The diameter of the bottom right hole is too small, and furthermore, the top right hole is out of alignment, with a measured distance of 4.44 millimeters. So this concludes the sample programs for this video. As mentioned earlier, I've not been able to test all of the features of the Vision Kit. These include, for example, a script function for advanced editing, multi-flow communication, intensity detection, feature defect detection, and pixel counting. It can read most of the common barcodes like QR, 2D, and 1D barcodes. It has optical character recognition for interpreting text, and even a deep learning functionality which can be used to train the system on existing defects. Time for some final thoughts. The Vision Kit is primarily intended for educational use, but I think it can also be used in an R&D environment or for small-scale manufacturing. I think it's a powerful system with lots of functionality. Although the software is very user-friendly with the graphical flow system, the sheer amount of options could be a bit overwhelming for new users. However, there is a good manual available. If you follow it step by step and go through all of the examples, things start to make sense and you will soon be able to create your own flows from scratch. Just don't expect to become an expert in a couple of hours. Given the extensive use of vision techniques in modern production facilities, I think it's very useful as an educational tool. The price for the system is around 1500 euros, for which you will get a camera with objective, a metal stand, and the Vision Studio software. Personally, I think this is a reasonable price, but of course that's for everyone to decide for themselves. It does put the system out of reach for most hobbyists and makers, which is a shame because it's a really awesome system and provides many new learning opportunities. For students in technical educations, I hope they will be able to practice with a system like this to get an introduction into machine vision. If this video was useful for you, please feel free to press the thumbs up button or to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.